Gospel reading for today is taken from John 6, verse 1 to 21. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what, was, what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down about five thousand in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. Let us pray and ask God's blessing for the meditation of His Word this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we are shown by the story that John gave us, a story about your son feeding the 5,000, and a story about him walking on water, making the disciple feel safe. Help us to feel safe and help us to know that you are feeding us with yourself. We pray all these in Jesus' name. Amen. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. That's how the Apostle John opens his gospel, the gospel that bears his name. Uh, for the next five weeks, our lectionary selection is taking a break from the gospel of Mark. Uh, for the next five weeks, we will be looking into the gospel of John, and I think for an important reason. I believe that in going back to John, the lectionary selection wants to remind the church of all ages that the reading is always trying to show the church something. Or more precisely, the reading is trying to show the church someone. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. The John selection for the next five weeks is intended to do just that, so that the disciples of Jesus throughout the ages will see that in all the things that Jesus did, in all the things that Jesus says, we are seeing the very essence of the glory of God. Now, John makes this clear by the way he tells the story of Jesus in his gospel. In chapters 2 all the way to 11, he gathers up seven miracles that Jesus did, and he calls them signs. John's word for them, for these miracles, is signs. It is his alternative word to miracles or to wonders. And in using the word signs, John does not, of course, have any reservation about the operation of the supernatural in all these things. It's just that he's more concerned about 
seeing beyond the miracles. He's more concerned about seeing beyond the wonders. He's more concerned about the significance of these things. They are signs. And so signs always signify something better and something bigger, excuse me, than itself. Signs always point to something bigger than itself. And another aspect of these signs that is worth noting is this. Whether deeds or words, Jesus commonly refers to them as works. And in him referring to them as works, it is meant to directly link his ministry to the ministry of his father. John 5, 17, for example, Jesus said, My father is still working, and I also am working. John is showing us that the union of the son and the father is so close and so intimate, so much so that the works of Jesus is the father's work in him. As we hear Jesus says in John 14, verse 10, Do you not believe that I am in the father and the father is in me? The words that I I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. And that's the reason why John brackets those words Jesus spoke and the deeds that Jesus did, these things that he calls signs, with the word glory. Chapter 2, after Jesus showed his first great sign of turning water into wine, John says in John 2 verse 11, that this is the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and that revealed his glory. And then in chapter 11, just before the last great sign, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, Jesus said in verse 40, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So glory, glory. Seven signs. First, turning water into wine. And then second, healing the official son. Third, healing the lame man. Fourth, feeding the 5,000. And fifth, walking on water. And sixth, healing the blind man. And seventh, raising Lazarus. Bracketed by the word glory. Now in our text, we are given the fourth and the fifth sign. And we will focus on them briefly one by one. The fourth sign, the feeding of the 5,000. The fifth sign, Jesus walking on water. And these two signs are very relevant to our present situation. And we will see why. In the fourth sign, we encounter Jesus who feeds all his people. In the fifth sign, we encounter Jesus who meets the anxieties of his disciples. The fourth sign emphasizes the social ministry of Jesus. The fifth sign emphasizes the spiritual ministry of Jesus. And the social ministry and the spiritual, are both equally important to our Lord, to Jesus. What a reassurance we need to hear in our present situation. Now let's look at the fourth sign, the feeding of the 5,000. If you notice, this is the only sign, other than the cross and the resurrection, that actually made it into all four Gospels. And this tells us that this event is considered very important in the early Christians, by the early Christians. Before this event, as we saw in our gospel reading last week, Jesus was actually planning to take some time off. He was needing some rest. As we saw last week, the disciples also needed some rest. They just returned from a very successful preaching ministry tour, a very successful mission trip. And they were exhausted and in need of rest. A rest. And so Jesus planned to take them to the hills to the east of the Sea of Galilee, the area known today as Golan Heights. And the crowd get wind of Jesus' whereabouts and follow him around the head of the lake. And rather than rejecting the crowd, Jesus accepts the interruption of his vacation, the interruption to his vacation, and minister to the crowd. Instead of rejecting them, Jesus gives them a sign. He has been feeding them with his teachings. Now the crowd is hungry and Jesus fills their stomachs. He takes a small offering of bread and fish, gives gives thanks for them, and distributes the food to the hungry crowd. 
there is enough bread for 12 basketful of leftovers. And for the fish, we're told that everybody ate as much as they wanted. Now, the sign points not simply to Jesus as the one who creates everything, as having mastery over creation, but how with Jesus, we actually move from scarcity to abundance. That's why I said earlier, the fourth sign emphasizes the social ministry of Jesus. There was a lack of sufficient money or food. We remember Philip telling Jesus that there was not enough money to buy food. Six months wages would not buy enough food for even them to just get a little. And Andrew told Jesus, there's a boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? The disciples look at the situation and see that there's not enough to go around. And so why spend little money we have when even a lot of money would not be enough? (laughs) Why take the little food the boy brought when it wouldn't even be an appetizer for Jesus and the disciples, much less a meal for a multitude? Resources are scarce, and when there's not enough to go around, it is not the time to share. (laughs) It is time to hoard. It is time to keep it for ourselves. (laughs) Have we seen this recently in our lifetime? (laughs) Think about toilet paper. (laughs) But Jesus has a different view of the situation. Jesus operates out of abundance. And not only there is always just enough, There is more than enough. For this hungry crowd, there is fish enough for all to get what they want. And bread enough to gather together 12 baskets full of leftover. (laughs) This is a sign that points also to the earlier experiences of Israel. If you remember, John tipped us off in verse 4 that the Passover is drawing near. And at that time of the year, the thoughts of the Jewish people naturally turned toward the Exodus experience, the Exodus story, to the time when people had been enslaved by Pharaoh. In times of plenty, we know that Pharaoh hoarded the surpluses produce of Egypt. And during famine, the people had been forced to give first their money, and after that their livestock, and then their land, and finally their lives to Pharaoh in exchange for food. The bread of Pharaoh was the bread of fear, of scarcity, of slavery. Pharaoh demanded their very life, and even still, there was never enough. And by the time of the Exodus, the children of Israel have long been slaves in the land of Egypt. And as the people were brought out of Egypt, they were fed in the wilderness with what? With manna the bread that came down from heaven. And Jesus himself will say, I am the bread that came down from heaven. That that is what we will look at next week. Each day in the wilderness, God gave the people all the food they needed. There was always enough and nothing could be hoarded. If the manna was hoarded, guess what happened? It would go bad, right? It would actually rot. This was the original daily bread a sign that God would be faithful day after day after day with enough to meet the people's needs. How amazing is our God? And with the story in their mind and also the miraculous feeding stories of the prophet Elijah and Elisha, the text that we'll actually have for our Old Testament reading, the people who gathered that day saw a sign. They ate bread and fish that Jesus broke and shared, and in so doing, they saw who is the ultimate sovereign. It wasn't Pharaoh, it's not Caesar, it's not even Herod, it's Jesus. And unlike Pharaoh or the other kings, this sovereign Jesus shows his sovereignty through solidarity. That is the key that we need to understand as Christians. We need to remember that, especially because in some Christian circles, those that demand loyalty to authority, usually the authority of a male pastor, God's sovereignty is often interpreted as something untouchable. And usually that would come out like this. If we question the authority of the male pastor, we are in somehow questioning the authority of God, and therefore 
we also question his sovereignty. <laughs> and that is a very bad way to understand God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty is always about solidarity. God's sovereignty is always about solidarity. And unlike Pharaoh, here we see the sovereign Jesus on the hillside freely offering abundance. Everything the people need came without cost. There would be more than enough for everyone because of the solidarity of our sovereign Lord. We come now to the fifth sign, Jesus walking on water. As I said earlier, these two signs are very relevant to our present situation. If in the fourth sign we encounter Jesus who feeds all his people, in the fifth sign we encounter Jesus who cares for the anxieties of his disciples. If the fourth sign emphasizes the social ministry of Jesus, the fifth sign emphasizes the spiritual ministry of Jesus. The fifth sign begins with the disciples alone in a boat, in the darkness, and then a storm blows up, as was frequently in the case of the Sea of Galilee. And with the storm comes discouragement on the disciples' part, as underlined by John. He said that it was dark. Suddenly, Jesus is seen, or at least an approaching figure is observed walking on the waves towards them. <laughs> this sign, as John tells us, is a terrifying sign. Why? Because people don't walk on water. At first, the disciples do not recognize him. Experienced sailor, sailors and fishermen as they are, they are terrified. Clearly something extraordinary is happening. The disciples are in a storm, but apparently they are more afraid of the Lord than they are of the storm. <laughs> and so unlike the previous miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, we may be tempted to ask, what good does this miracle do? <laughs> what is being signified by this sign? Well, there is definitely occasions when Jesus' coming seems to only intensify our troubles, right? Have you exper experienced that? You experience the presence of Jesus, but it seems like our troubles just intensify. Later in John, we see that in Peter's experience as meeting Jesus, forced him to painfully face his failure. For Paul, it was when he responded to the call of Christ to go to Macedonia. He ended up, uh, you know, bloody, a victim in Roman prison. And from the mouth of Jesus, we hear that his coming can unite, but it also can divide. And it can bring rejection rather than acceptance. And so Jesus' coming can seem to intensify our troubles. The text shows us that in the storm, Jesus comes to them. Verse 19. You see, even if he may have been out of their sight, the disciples have never been out of his sight. What a great reminder for us. From this, we see that his commitment to his church is unconditional. His church, whatever her limitation is, will never be abandoned by the one who is the head of the church. And as he comes, he stills the disciples' fear. He does that with his word of greeting. It is I, he said. It is I, don't be afraid. Or more literally, it is I, stop being afraid. But you see, it's easy to give or receive advice. Stop being afraid. <laughs> but when fear is crippling, let me ask you, what authority does that advice have? Not a whole lot, right? It's just an advice. It can even turn out to be a very annoying advice. <laughs> but here's where Jesus' advice is not just some any old advice. You see, the, word it is, the words it is I is a translation of the Greek ego, Amy. And if you remember in the other sermons we've looked at from the Gospel of John, Jesus saying, Ego, Amy, in the Gospel of John, Jesus saying, Ego, Amy, is Jesus' divine self affirmation, often reproduced in this Gospel as, I am. 
Ego eimi, I am. Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman. The one who is speaking to you, ego eimi. I am, ego eimi, the bread of life. The verse that we will look at next week. I am, ego eimi, the true vine. And my father is the wine dresser. A text that we looked at in the month of May. Now, the words, of course, can be natural enough in this context as a means of Jesus just to identify himself to disciples. Hey, it's me. It's Jesus. It's me. Don't be afraid. (laughs) But knowing John and his purpose of showing us the glory of the Son of Man, I believe he intends for us to see more, especially if we recall the Passover background that he gave to us earlier. The deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt brought them to the wilderness, wandering and got supernatural sustenance by means of the manna, which we look at the fourth sign. But that wilderness experience was reached by way of the Red Sea and the supreme demonstration of the glory and majesty of God as he parted the waters for his people, what we see in Exodus, that Jesus now here appears as Lord of the waves and the seas. And so I'm convinced that when in John we hear Jesus saying, Ego, Amy, stop being afraid. John is in fact showing Jesus, who is the personal manifestation of the same Almighty who separated the waters at the Red Sea. And guess what? As soon as Jesus got into the boat, There is apparently another miracle. As we read in verse 21, as soon as Jesus got into the boat, the boat reached the destination that they're going to reach, the land toward which they're going. Two things as we close that the text can offer us as help in our present situation. As I said, these two signs are very, very relevant to our situation right now. First, in our present situation, it is very easy for us to be tempted to see there is not enough to go around. And there is an element of truth to that because there is scarcity. And because of that, it causes us to feel this way. Resources are scarce. Money is tight. And when there is not enough to go around, our tendency is to hoard. Our tendency is not to share. With a different view of the situation, Jesus shows us not only is there always just enough, but there is more than enough. And Jesus is calling his church to operate the way he operates, out of abundance. Even if it's scarce, we share what we have, and the scarcity is turned into abundance. And while we do that, we experience freedom. Why? Because you and I know that we can experience a crippling sense of scarcity even when we are surrounded by an abundance of possession. And so the fourth sign shows us how important social ministry is for Jesus. The same social ministry Jesus is calling us to participate in. The fifth sign emphasizes the spiritual ministry of Jesus. Which brings us to the second relevancy for our situation. The ministry God offers to his people since the beginning of time. And that ministry is, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You see, in the storm, it is easy to lose our bearing. It is easy to lose our spirit. So Jesus coming to them in the storm is his way of showing the church that we have never been out of his sight. Even if he may have been out of our sight, he does not have us out of his sight. And it is his presence that brings a renewed hope, a sense of power to a group of dispirited disciples. And to us too, his dispirited church. And to our individual lives as well. 
You see, the, the, the last word does not lie with the world, it does not lie with our situation, no matter how threatening its manifestations. The last word is ego eimi. The last words are I am. I am. Jesus still comes walking upon the waves. And as we recover the experience of his presence, we realize that we have always been carried by our triumphant Lord onto that eternal shore for which we are destined to go. May we, after being reminded of this, be strengthened in our inner being with power through His Spirit, according to the riches of His glory, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, as we being rooted and grounded in the love that is broad, the love that is long, the love that is high and deep, so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Father, the only thing that we can say after being reminded of the truth that we live in through your Son, Jesus Christ, and in the power of the Holy Spirit is our thanksgiving. And so we thank you. We thank you that we can be reminded that Jesus cares for our social well-being, for our stomach, for our physical well-being. And Jesus also invites us to care for the physical and social well-beings of others. And we're reminded that while we do that, He never leaves us nor forsakes us. He's always present, especially in the storm. And so help us remind us ourselves today to know that He is with us and to live in the freedom that he offers to us, his church. For the glory and the praise of his name we pray. Amen. Amen.